one actually cannot get away with borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, and hence the need for prudent government spending in all its aspects. Singapore is a small, open economy, a city-state with no natural resources. So, I think that first and foremost, it is a realisation of what Singapore is and of the constraints of being a small city-state with no natural resources. The constraint is that there is a very small domestic market. Hence, there is a need actually to export our goods. There is a need, in a sense, to make use of what the world can offer in terms of markets, technology, capital and so on. And hence, an openness to foreign technology, to foreign capital, even to foreign professional workers to come here to work. The second aspect, I think, is that because of the fact that we are so small, we have in many ways only one resource ultimately, and that's our people. So to realise that human resource development and education is probably the most important uh, fundamental factor in Singapore's economic development. The third aspect is, I think, with regards to government policy and government spending. And that is the fact that one actually cannot get away with borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, and hence the need for prudent government spending in all its aspects. So I would say that these would be the three fundamental factors accounting for Singapore's economic success. Today, it's the most densely populated state in the world. In 1819, when the British set up a trading post on the island, they found a settlement of 150 here, and wild animals roaming its jungles and marshes. It was made a free port, trade flourished, and since independence in the late 50s, this multicultural community of Singaporeans has carefully nurtured and developed its legacy as an international focal point of business and trade. Singapore has always been strategically placed it has, after independence, uh, under a very, I think, skillful leadership of the Singapore government, Lee Kuan Yew, in the first place, they have succeeded to take advantage of this geographic position. Plus, that they have realized that uh, the economy of Singapore will be much more quickly developed if you concentrate on creating possibilities for exports not like many other poor countries in the past, decided to try to change their economy to substitute imports by own domestic industries. Singapore has always been outward looking, wanting to facilitate trade over the borderlines. Uh, Singapore is one of the most ardent spokesmen for free trade in the world. There are practically no tariffs in this country. This liberal approach is complemented by a disciplined society. It isn't by chance, for example, that Singapore is one of the cleanest cities in the world. Throwing so much as a cigarette end away can lead to a hefty fine. Other laws restrict smoking, gambling, chewing gum and the right to strike. Legislation has also helped the authorities come to grips with a previously rampant narcotics problem. Possessing and selling morphine or heroin can today lead to the death sentence. The goal is such that Anything that stands in the way, chewing gum or ethnic problems or whatever, will be very sternly dealt with. I think, again, all these regulations and so on will have to be understood in terms of the overall philosophy of state before individual. This little island nation, barely 640 square kilometres in land area, has a standard of living comparable to any developed nation. But you need go no further than to the old parts of the city, in the process of renewal, to be reminded of the scale and speed of Singapore's growth, and to experience the melting pot of people behind its economic miracle. Over 75% of Singaporeans are Chinese, 15% Malays, and about 7% Indians. 
But there are also some 60,000 ethnic Arabs, Japanese, as well as Europeans. They display an energy and work ethic that's all the more remarkable when you remember that Singapore is in the humid tropical belt with average daytime temperatures of up to 30 degrees Celsius. Singaporeans are said to be the only peoples in equatorial areas to dispense with a siesta after lunch, with some exceptions, of course. I would say Singaporeans are very proud of their country. They are amazed at their own prosperity and Singaporeans travel very widely to the countries in the region and will be able to come back and make comparisons to their own advantage. So I think we have reached a stage when there is genuine admiration, gratitude to the government for giving us what uh, it, has, it has. But, now this is a big but here, I think that in terms of material prosperity, there is just no question about Singapore's success and well-being and so on. But that's the other side the less tangible things, the things that are less quantifiable, you know, more qualitative. So when it comes to things like, um, are Singaporeans extremely happy? Do they have a sense of identity, right? a multi-ethnic society? Is there this total cohesion that makes everybody happy? Now, there are still, I think, question marks. For example, there is the flip side of our material prosperity. Has it thrown up a whole generation of Singaporeans who are selfish, materialistic, mindless of tradition, who are very self-centred, in fact, who are beginning to be called ugly Singaporeans. We don't want to use this term too much. Right? But there is a certain trait, for example, that we have begun to identify in ourselves. And it is not a very attractive trait, I'm afraid. It is this grasping, totally materialistic um, quality that makes Singaporeans very calculating, over-pragmatic, maybe not too adventurous, a little bit closed a little bit reluctant to take risks and certainly very uh, uh, jealous of their own self-interest. Right? Uh, we are told that this happens in all societies, you know, but uh, this is something that certainly worries us a little. Singapore is heterogeneous. I think uh, because of the existence of Chinese, Malays and Indian and many religions, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, you will find that these could be possible sources of tension and conflict and minority issues could always surface. And certainly some minority parties that choose to build their support on a minority vote have used religion language in the past and sometimes do raise this now and again to win votes. Outwardly, the multiplicity of religions in Singapore manifests itself in most lively ways with a wide variety of festivals and other celebrations which the authorities fully encourage. By far the most dominating religions are Taoism and Buddhism, but that doesn't stop people joining in each other's celebrations, such as the Christian New Year, as we see here. Singapore was a British colony for, you know, more than a hundred years. And uh, once we became independent, the government took a decision to keep English as the language of business and the civil service and government. It is the language of the modern sector. To that extent, you find that Singaporeans are modern, Western in orientation. But there is a very large base where the language at home is in Chinese, Malay, Indian regional language, Tamil, Bengali, etc. And the cultural norms at the home is not as obviously Western as Western societies. The cultural heritage is still very strong. The language is English. The cultural heritage is a strong dose of the traditional cultures. And young people, as they move into the modern society, acquire 
some aspects of the Western cosmopolitan culture. I think if you move around Singaporeans, you'll find different people having different degrees of Westernization. And that's what we are. Now, thank you. group is encouraged to go on its own. So you have the Chinese being encouraged to celebrate Chinese New Year, for example, in a big way. There are the Chinese villages. You would have seen a number of them. The Indian, similarly, the Indian villages, Malay villages, and so on. So each ethnic group is encouraged to celebrate. Now, of course, there has been this fear, which has been voiced publicly, that if you encourage them to go separately culturally, you could actually be sowing the seeds of future uh, uh, disunity. But uh, the government feels that this is just one level of Singapore life. If above this, there is unity based on respect for each other, based on a shared economic prosperity, it need not be too bad a thing. So the kind of culture that we are evolving would have to be double layered. The top shared by all with uh, uh, the common language being English, really. You know, we communicate with each other in English, even among the Chinese themselves. And this would be, I suppose, bound to Western technology. It would be, in many ways, um, influenced by the West. And then below this, below, but not necessarily subservient to it, would be the development of our old ethnic cultures. Will these two be synthesized and integrated? We are not quite sure, but if they coexist, that's good enough. A one-kilometre-long causeway links Singapore to mainland Malaysia. Like Singapore, Malaysia is multi-ethnic and multi-religious, with Malays in the majority, coexisting with Chinese, Indians and other groups. Malaysia is relatively well off and its economy is booming. But that's where the similarity ends and the contrasts begin. Malaysia's population is almost six times that of Singapore's, spread over a land area 500 times the size of Singapore's. It has important natural resources, tin, rubber and oil, as well as a growing agricultural sector. And fishing is one of the traditional occupations that survive as everyday necessities in Malaysia. Meanwhile, just eight kilometers south across the causeway, you have access to one of the most modern urban transport systems in the world. It took barely three years to build Singapore's Mass Rapid Transit System, or MRT. Covering 67 kilometers of track and 42 stations, the system services a large chunk of Singapore's suburbs with their characteristic self-contained housing estates. Satellite towns, which, while improving people's living conditions, have also changed traditional patterns of Asian family life. The MRTs relieved congestion in the city center, part of which is restricted to traffic during peak travel hours. Improving the infrastructure is one way of optimizing resources, another is education. Because human resource development is so important to us that a lot of emphasis has been placed on education. In the 1960s and the early 1970s, the emphasis was on primary education and that was really to, to educate a large mass of people and especially the young people. Then when that was largely fulfilled 
by about the early to the mid-70s, the emphasis then switched to secondary education and then also to technical education. Now, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, the emphasis is on tertiary education, more specialist education and so on. And hence, we find that we are now going to have three universities, where 10 years ago, we only had one. The political leadership over the last 25 to 30 years have given emphasis to supporting those who are able. In other words, if you have the ability, more should be given to you. Resources should be spent on you. This is because Singapore is seen to be a country that is very small with 2.7 million people, 3 million, including visitors, the transients. Resource is of the highest premium, so we must develop this human resource. At the same time, while saying that we believe that those who are able should be helped, I think Singapore also helps those who are less able. We draw a bottom line. Resources are spent on creating a viable and a good school system, education system, to help those who are not as quick in learning. But the question is whether one should neglect those who are able because one is afraid of stepping out and to, of appearing to be elitist. I think in Singapore, we believe in helping those who are able. It is meritocracy rather than elitism. An amazing variety of parks and zoological gardens provide another source of knowledge linked with entertainment and open to all and sundry. The Jurong Bird Park has more than four and a half thousand birds and includes a two hectare walk-in aviary. It's amazing how adaptable polar bears can be, isn't it? As for the apes, well, life here is just one big party. We are a mix, a mix of the old and the new, a mix of east and west. In many ways, we have a western face. The city skyline is very western, but our soul is very Asian. And in that sense, I think we have great tourism appeal. The underwater world offers further evidence of the Singaporean skill at reproducing natural environments in limited space, providing easy access for visitors. This zoo of marine life, complete with man-eating predators, is one of the many attractions on the little resort island of Sentosa, one kilometre or so offshore and jam-packed with attractions. You're under the water here, viewing 400 species of marine life from below, but remaining safe and dry within a transparent tunnel. Chinese history, tradition, mythology and more are all on display at the Hao Pa Villa Park, with several theatres, lavish audio-visual presentations and adventure playgrounds. Up the road, a whole era of China's history has been reproduced, an entire 12-hectare village from the Tang Dynasty. Attractions such as these are of interest not only for the locals, but for the over five million foreign tourists who come to Singapore annually. Tourism is an important uh, contributor to Singapore's economy. Uh, one in every 12 people in Singapore work in the tourism-related industry. Uh, Singapore's tourism receipts contribute to over $7.6 billion, Singapore dollars that is, to our GDP. Singapore must have the biggest number of golf courses in relation to land area in the world. The Raffles Club, named after the man who got it all going in Singapore, is one of six with 18 holes. The limited land area here hasn't prevented the spread of leisure centres, with the most ingenious solutions being applied to create space. In terms of uh, why we run or why we have luxury hotels, I think that's more to do with the, the people. Um, we are able to um, have a service within Asian hotels, which is considered far superior to uh, 
many other places in the world. Um, the concentration and the number of people we actually employ in each hotel is far higher than it would be in many other international destinations. And the, the cultures lend themselves very well to uh, the, the creation of a, a most excellent standard, particularly in terms of the service standards. The Raffles Hotel has become a legend among hotels, frequented by royalty, diplomats, as well as writers such as Hemingway, Conrad, Kipling and Morn. The hotel was recently fully restored to its original shape. The hotel actually started as a little bungalow house with about 10 rooms in 1887 and by 1915 um, all the wings were added and completed. The demand does not lie only in, in the suites. We only have 104 suites but um, there are so many other facilities that guests can enjoy to, to just have a feel of Raffles Hotel and that could be just having a drink, having a Singapore sling at the long bar or the bar and billet room. It could be having a meal at the courtyard here or um, the tiffin room for tiffin curry. So it's, it's not just confined to the suites alone. Fast, comprehensive and reliable air links with the outside world are a prerequisite for a society such as Singapore's. Today it has one of the very best airports in the world and its carriers, Singapore Airlines, along with neighbouring Thai Air, are among the few national air carriers still returning regular profits. Well, I think the European airlines uh, have a problem with, with uh, the cost of staff in relation to the, their total operating cost. And in our case, uh, that uh, our share of personnel cost in relation to our total operating cost is approximately only half of, of that of the European carriers. This is where it all started, Singapore Harbour, a focal point on the world's ocean trade routes. Among the busiest in the world in terms of tonnage and a major point of transshipment. A free port on a platform of free trade doesn't this open up some leeway for doubtful dealings? There is no corruption in Singapore. It's a clean society. I think the, the reason why Singapore has become such a clean society is the conscientious efforts by the present and previous leadership of the country, I'm thinking of Lee Kuan Yew himself in the first instance, to wipe out from the beginning all possible um, stains of malpractice or bad practice in, in, in administration, in, in business, and to see to it that uh, the, um, the Singapore administration and the Singapore business is as clean as at all is possible. I think they have succeeded. Singapore is the financial centre of Southeast Asia. Literally hundreds of foreign banks and financial institutions operate here. Significantly, a bank boasts the highest building in Southeast Asia. Banking and finance, together with an advanced electronics industry, form the mainstay of Singapore's economy. All this is backed up by a sophisticated international telecom system. Growth has slowed down, though, after the boom of the 80s, but it's still at a level that's the envy of many European nations. If we had a growth rate of, like Singapore's of around 5-6%, we would be very, very happy. And uh, <clears throat> it's obvious that Singapore and the other ASEAN countries are having a slower growth, but I think it's healthy for them, and I think they themselves realize that it's healthy for them not to have a too rapid growth. You must, after all, in a way, you must consume your successes. You can't just go on year after year after year with growth rates of 10, 11 percent, as many of the countries here did during the 1980s. And I think that we will see in 10, 15 years' time Southeast Asia combined with Southern China and Indochina having a say in the world trade which corresponds roughly to what Europe has, to what North America has, to what Japan has. That means that this part of the world will be the fourth leg of the world economy which means that I think we have to already now pay much, much more attention to what is happening here than we unfortunately seem to be doing up to now. Singapore has been described as a sweet shop for adults. The city is dotted with shopping centers displaying a staggering range of goods. But the prices aren't necessarily the cheapest in the world. In many cases, you can pick up better bargains in Hong Kong, for example. 
But it's still worth it, and you have to be prepared to haggle. And there can't be many places in the world that have the variety of food that's available here. From all four corners of the globe, with Oriental cuisine dominating, of course. No wonder business folk here often spend up to two hours or more closing deals over a chopstick lunch. The streets of Singapore are safe places, day or night. Singaporeans can enjoy their city. Incomes are good, unemployment is low and life expectancy is today among the highest in the world. I think the remarkable thing about Singapore is that the political leadership has always gone to the people, treated them as rational people, to say, this is the way we should do things, because these are the reasons. You have a recession, we must do these. People listen and say, yes, we have a recession. You must cut back on salary. There's no point killing the goose that lays a golden egg. But no individual is completely satisfied, you know. Press him or her, and there'll be something that they would want more. I think Singaporeans are just like that. It is not bread and butter now. It is what kind of jam you're going to have.